Thanks for having me. I'm totally excited. Physics. Okay, physics, probably say the discipline, scientific discipline concerned with processes in space and time. So maybe let me just show you a most remarkable process occurring in space and time. You're seeing nuclei, this is zebrafish, six hours in the life of the zebrafish embryo. You're seeing uh, nuclei from different tissues labeled in different colors. And this thing is able to organize itself into essentially everything that makes up a living fish in just a couple of hours. So, so you have a bag of cells that self-organizes itself into any old structure that life needs, be it a fish, be it a mouse, be it an elephant, um, you know, the processes are all very similar. So how does living matter structure itself? And of course, we're not the first to ask these types of questions. I'm gonna point you to this fantastic read. Uh, you know, this is, uh, basically came out of a lecture series that Avin Schrödinger, um, you know, was giving at the end of the Second World War. He went to Dublin, Trinity College in Dublin, um, you know, left Germany, was taken out of his usual environment and started just to think about, you know, life, living, you know, or maybe I can say more broadly, materials at higher temperatures. <laughs> so let me just read one quote. Um, living matter is likely to involve other laws of physics hitherto unknown, which once revealed will form just an integral part of science as the former. So that is such a deep statement, you know. You know, I know what I want to do the rest of my life, my scientific career, which is exactly this. Identify a couple of laws of physics or find laws of physics that we already know about and apply them. And doing this by studying living systems. There's two principal ways to do this. You can be a physicist and look at, you know, and look at, I'm just going to say a little bit, look at biology as a playground. That's one way to do it, totally legitimate. But I think it's just as good and perhaps even more useful to just look at these systems that evolution has managed to develop, study them, Take the physicist's approach, identify those laws that might be under, you know, underlying their types of self-organization processes. And in doing this, you'll also, you're likely to find new phenomena because everything is out of equilibrium. Everything's slightly non-equilibrium. So, for example, if we think about liquid-liquid phase separation, we'll touch a little bit, bit upon this. Of course, this is just, you know, very Huggins, but it's in the out of equilibrium context. So, you know, and that'll, that'll, give, that'll always bring novelty also on the side of physics. So when investigating living systems, we might expect new developments also on the side of physics. And I'll try to give you a couple of examples of that. And of course, in an un, you, know, you said it perfectly at the beginning, this is, this is in the end about bridging scales from single molecule types of activities, behaviors, understanding what an individual protein does in this context, but then bridging to the larger emergent meso collective uh, mesoscale. I'm gonna use the word mesoscale uh, here and there. I think it's key. So three topics. Our lab, we really try to take the biology approach, look at you know, everything I'll tell you today is in C. elegans, a nematode worm, but we combine this with theory and kind of biophysical types of experimentation. So C. elegans, I think it's the hydrogen atom for cell and tissue biophysics because it's got an invariant cell lineage. It's a robot types of development fluctuations in this kind of invariant development uh, matter and are interpretable. And you know, even the theorists in my lab um, can pick worms and put them under the microscope. You need a little bit of skill of this, but it's, it's a perfect system uh, to really be quantitative about uh, you know, morphogenetic processes. So the worm is basically a gut and a gonad. So, uh, you know, and a brain, okay. <laughs> um, and what we're going to do is we're going to look, take a kind of a stroll through the rep reproductive system of the worm, which I'm showing you here. So what you're seeing is basically the germline. There's germ cells here that develop into oocytes that get fertilized. The elegans is a hermaphrodite, so it can self-fertilize. It first makes sperm, and then it makes oocytes. Um, so we see everything here. We see germ cells, oocytes, and embryos developing multicellular types of processes. And I'm gonna, we're going to look at three types of phases as in the life of an early uh, C. elegans embryo. Okay? And we'll start with, we'll go backwards a little bit. We'll start with, you know, um, you know multicellular types of developmental processes. So which, which is the single molecule that drives all these types of developments? Well, it's myosin. <laughs> Of course, not quite true, uh, but in essence, you know, in fact, I'm, I'm even being more inaccurate. So, so here's my favorite movie of all times, which is this is a two-headed myosin stepping along an actin filament recorded with high-speed AFM. So this is myosin 5, not myosin 2. The myosin that's driving morphogenesis is, is non-muscle myosin 2, but anyway, uh, while we're kind of being too simplistic about it, I'm just going to make this statement. This single molecule activity, A, 
not a two-headed, a single-headed myosin, you know, walking, you know, um, kind of, you know, exerting forces with respect to an actin filament. You can see the pitch of the actin filament here. Huh? These will become important. This molecular activity amplified a billion times <laughs> is what drives morphogenesis, okay? And, of course, it doesn't do it in the void. It does it in a particular cellular organelle, I'm going to call it, the actomyosin cortical layer, and we're going to focus a lot on this structure. This is a thin structure, about 100 nanometers thick. Of course, it depends on the cell type and so forth. It separates plasma membrane from cytoplasm, mainly made out of actin filaments. They can be disordered. They can be ordered. And then myosin II that assembles into these mini-filament-like mini structures. Okay? This structure sets cell shapes, drives active processes like cell division. And, you know, and the key question is, what is it really? What, you know, what happens when you put molecules, the molecules that are present in this layer together? You know, what is so special about it? So let's start to think about this in the worm. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the embryos. I don't know how well you can see it, but there's a couple of the fertilized embryos down here. So let's zoom into some of these embryos. Now I'm showing you an image uh, here you see a nice one-cell embryo where the actin filaments are labeled in kind of bluish, and the membrane, uh, uh, you know, isn't whatever, magenta, I guess, the other color. And what we'll look at is the surface of this embryo. Um, but do remember, you know, in everything I'm going to show you today, we usually look at the surface, but this is a real 3D embryo. So this, this C. elegans embryo, uh, so it has an eggshell, so the shape is kind of fixed. And inside it, in the one cell, at the one-cell embryo state, there's a single cell that kind of is inflated against the eggshell. And at the, top, at the surface of this, um, you know, below the plasma membrane of this cell is this actomyosin cortical layer. But the whole structure really is an egg. So it's 50 microns along the long axis and then 20 in the two short dimensions. So we can look in, we can zoom in even just a little bit more. So this is the kind of the best microscopes we have available. This is a, a structured illumination turf recording. And, you know, you know, here we see at a particular time, uh, we see these actin filaments in red, you know, bundles, perhaps some of them. We see all the individual myosin filaments in green. So I could just stop here because we can just try to segment out all of the actin filaments and then you know, identify all, uh, you know, the myosin uh, mini filaments, and then that's that. <laughs> but the question, of course, to ask is what is this structure really? I hope you can see this is just a couple of frames one second apart, so you're just seeing five seconds. It's looping, okay? Um, uh, you know, one thing I do want you to realize, it's flowing, okay? So the whole structure is flowing, uh, you know, from this would be the posterior end of the embryo towards the anterior side. Uh, you know, what makes it flow? Okay, we, so we started asking ourselves these types of simple questions and really wanting to get at a proper physical description of this structure, okay? And it's physical laws that gives rise that will dictate its behaviors at larger scales. So really, so again, a pledge to the mesoscale, okay? I'm not going to do an all atom simulation or all molecules. That's not gonna, that's not, I'm not satisfied with that. I want to know what are, you know, the relevant state variables, how do they relate to each other, and how can I capture biological processes with these types of descriptions and thinking. So at a larger scale, I'm gonna give it away. This is really a two-dimensional material Essentially, it's, I told you it's 100 nanometer th thick. That's a short dimension relative to the dimension of the whole cell, 50 microns. So in all, for all ex purposes, this is a two-dimensional object. It's fluid-like. You can see the individual filaments here for the five seconds. But if you wait 30 seconds and go back, all the filaments are, are you know, depolymerized and replaced with new ones. So elastic energy stored by bending, for example, a filament, that'll dissipate over the turnover time scale. So on time scales of minutes, this is a fluid-like structure. So you can think of this as a thin sheet of honey, <laughs> poor honey on a table, it's a thin sheet of honey. But it has a remarkable um, you know, it, you know, activity, which it can set itself into motion. Our thin layer of honey here has fuel available at the molecular scale, ATP, that can drive force generation by mice and um, motor proteins that can, if properly arranged, and we'll have to think about that, set, the, set this layer into motion spontaneously. So this is about active matter physics and about bridging from the molecular to the uh, mesoscale and, th you know, and about thinking about the one thing that probably, you know, at this level of description separates uh, dead, the inanimate from the living matter, which is that as, exactly as I said. So this... You know, this realization brought about the birth of what is now known as active matter physics. 
Okay? And Frank Ulicher, you know, this is, you know, there's many people that have contributed to this field, but Frank Ulicher, our collaborator, long-term collaborator from Dresden, has been one of the driving forces of this field. So really this is a branch of soft conden condensed matter physics, where you have soft condensed matter that's driven out of equilibrium at molecular scales by the avail availability of a chemical fuel. And the cytoskeleton, the cellular cytoskeleton is a prime example. So, you know, you've got motor proteins, they burn ATP, they're gen gonna generate forces at the molecular scale that can be then, you know, can give rise to stresses at larger scales that can give rise to motions and deformations and shear and so forth. But the biggest problems that we have that we're gonna face are the question of, you know, of course, what we wanna do is we wanna identify generic physical principles and robust properties of active biological matter, okay? And the point is, the first question, what are the state variables? What are the relevant mesoscale quantities that we need to investigate in order to understand, you know, that's not obvious. And I'm gonna give you, and you know, active matter physics does provide us a systematic approach of how to get to them. But I think, you know, that's not the end of it. This is, you know, we'll have to do a lot more work and thinking, um, you know, you know it's, it's closed, the whole approach, you know, it's systematic. Um, but I'm not quite sure it's sufficient. So there's a lot of potential for this for the next 20, 30 years to come. I'm, I'm totally convinced. Okay, so this is a hydrodynamic approach based on irreversible thermodynamics, okay, and it's a field theory. So we're gonna, of course, you saw the cortex is 2D. So we'll look at lots of little surface elements and connect them to each other. And the, as I've just said, what are the relevant mesoscale quantities? Do I, what do I have to look at at the larger scale in order to even make sense of these types of structures? Well, you know, you know, irreversible thermodynamics gives us a systematic way to do this. So we'll do two things. We'll look at conservation laws and we'll look at local broken symmetries. And we'll do this on large lengths and long times. So conservation laws, each conservation law, for example, momentum conservation. Okay, we know momentum's conserved. You can't, you know, we'll have to, of course, you know, uh, you know, acknowledge Newton's laws. That means that if there's momentum conservation at large lengths, it's useful just to look at momentum or velocity. Okay, that's a quantity that's going to be important to look at because it is conserved, okay? Similarly, mass is conserved, which uh, means that I should be looking at mass densities, concentrations of molecules, those are gonna be relevant quantities. Um, I can have asymmetric objects. The active filaments are sticks, okay? They can be, you know, not aligned with respect to each other in kind of a disorder configuration, but they can also all align, align in a particular direction. And if they do so, that might lead to changes at larger scales. So it's going to be relevant to look at a local order parameter, like a pneumatic order parameter or a polar order parameter. And then once I have the, what I would deem to be the complete set of state variables, the important thing to think about is, of course, how are they all connected? What are the rules by which changes to some lead to changes in others? And for this, we're going to pursue this kind of near equilibrium irreversible thermodynamics approach. Um, we're going to first identify a free energy, F, that depends on local state variables. So free energy is gonna be a function of all, so let's say I have, a, I have three state variables. Where's my mouse pointer, okay? And then my free energy is gonna be a function of these three um, state variables, okay? And now the assumption is that these state variables will be at or near equilibrium, okay? So this separation, one way to think about this, the separation of time scales is large enough that systems you know, will have a tendency to equilibrate and that's going to be relevant also uh, for the, in the ways that the systems uh, operate at larger scales. So let's say three state variables, maybe the position variable, maybe a concentration variable, um, and whatever, you know, pressure variable, I don't know. Um, so here's the equilibrium con you know, kind of condition. So they would like to each go towards this equilibrium state. And we have the free energy, local free energy profile near this equilibrated configuration. And they're all at or near equilibrium. So let's just say the position variable on top is you know, slightly off, but the other's a bit closer. So now the point is if, if one such state variable is out of equilibrium, I can, I, you know, I can generally identify a kind of effective force that'll try to push that state variable towards equilibrium. So if you think about this, you know, this point here being a position variable, and then it's in a valley kind of configuration, there'll be a force. So if it's a position variable, it's a real force, but we call these generalized forces because you know, they, this also applies to kind of state variables that are not position variables. So each, this gives us a way to kind of calculate an effective generalized force that'll try to push that state variable back towards equilibrium. Okay, it's all very simple until now. So this 
quantity now one gets, receives a force that would like to move it back to equilibrium. Now the key thought here, and this comes, goes back to Onsaga and people working in statistical mechanics back in the days, is that this thermodynamic force, the fact that one state variable is out of equilibrium, this can affect all the others. So this force can push this state variable out of equilibrium, or it can push, you know, can push, the, can, can push others towards equilibrium or out of equilibrium. So, so now think about this. One quantity is out of equilibrium. It's going to try to relax to equilibrium, but in doing so, it can push others out. So if you know, in particular, let's just say we're going to have the first state variable be a concentration of ATP. We clamp it. We don't let it fix. This can now drive evolution of all the other state variables. Okay? So that's the approach. Um, you know, we, and that happens now in space, okay, <laughs> in a field, okay, and then of course we have to obey all the conservation laws, momentum, uh, and so forth. Um, um, and I'll give you, and as I said before, this goes back to Onsaga, so it's called Onsaga theory as well. Um, uh, so, um, and I'll give you one example that'll be relevant for uh, the cortex, okay. So this is what's, what you'd call the considerative relation of a 1D compressible Stokes fluid. So let's think about honey, okay. So no momentum, this is a Stokes fluid, okay. So, um, you, know, um, you know, low Reynolds number hydrodynamics. And we'll think about a one-dimensional fluid, just to keep it all simple. In one dimension, the total stress is given by the local shear rate, okay. So if everything moves at constant velocity, then nothing is being compressed. Okay, there's no, the only, so if there are velocity gradients, if some parts move quicker than others, then locally you can experience a shear, and the total stress will just be uh, proportional, and the proportion, constant of proportionality of viscosity to the local shear rate, which is a velocity gradient. So that's passive 1D fluid. Now, let's replace this with an active fluid that has Meissen motors that have a ATP con concentration that's clamped, so they get constantly driven out of equilibrium. So the additional process um, that can contribute at larger scales is the tendency of each of these elements to self-contract by the burning of a fuel. And this means we have an additional term in our constitutive relation, we have an active stress. The active stress could depend on the concentration of myosin. That's gonna give rise to contractions. You know, and of course, the active stress, if properly distributed, can start to set the system into motion. Okay, okay so really, this is a formalism for describing active biological matter at the mesoscale, okay? So we've looked at these types of activities together with Frank. Um, so what I've told you about in one dimension, this is, would be, an, you know, the, the interesting activity of the cortex would be an, to, that it can generate an isotropic active tension, two dimensions, which means we can have anisotropies also and the ability to generate active uh, stresses. Filaments can align and the system can contract preferentially in one direction and perhaps most excitedly, most, you know, much of my lab is working on, at this on the moment, is that you know, the cortex can also generate active torques. Actin is a helical filament. Symmetries <coughs> can be appropriately broken in order to allow for torque generation, and this, act, in fact, becomes relevant. So with active tension, with exactly that 1D Stokes fluid, here's our same, you know, this is basically our material law now. Uh, we can now relate, we can look at the distribution of myosin, where the myosins are, so these white little uh, patches, it's also broken up into patches, but that should be irrelevant uh, uh, for this discussion. Um, we can look at where the myosin is and we can relate that quantitatively to the flow field, okay? So this um, is nice, this works at the subcellular scale. This also works at the supracellular scale in tissues. We've worked with the Heisenberg lab um, when there was still in Dresden and more recently with the Tumanschak lab to look at the force balance in tissues to study gastrulatory processes. We can do laser cutting. Um, to measure the stresses in the systems to really make sure that our theory matches up and so forth. And I'm not going to give you details here, uh, but, um, you know, it's just maybe suffices to say that a force balance is a force balance and it should operate at also different types of scales. Filaments can align. So there's a particularly interesting feature in the nematode worm when this cortex is flowing that there is a constriction generated, even though there is no spindle there, no mitotic spindle there. So this is a constriction that's generated at a time when there's no cell division, so it's called pseudo-cleavage for precisely that. So, so this, is, this is a well-described phenomenon in, in the nematode. So pseudo-cleavage comes about. We could show that this is a mere byproduct of shear flows. You can see <coughs> that the posterior side of the embryo flows, but the anterior side doesn't flow so much. Okay, so I hope you see that there's a clear velocity gradient. Along here, I always say that if you're in the car 
and the front doesn't move and the back moves. Okay, uh -huh. <laughs> okay so you're being compressed. So these filaments are being compressed. When they're compressed, they generate active, actively generate you know, anisotropic active tension that's going to give rise to an aggression. So this is a pure, pure physical phenomenon of generating an aggression uh, in the system. And finally, torques. Um, you know, we, we discovered that in the worm, these flow fields always have a handedness. Um, and in particular, this turned into a project when we realized there's a particular genetic perturbation where we can, um, um, you know, where we can amplify this kind of chiral motion. So the, the flow fields have a slightly twisted component to them. It's always with the same handedness in the one cell stage embryo. And of course, also very interesting because from the point of physics, we now have a problem, a hydrodynamic problem. This is 2D hydrodynamics where torques are relevant. So the question here is how do you get from active chiral processes, torques generated between molecules and filaments to large scale left-right asymmetric movements. And the only thing I want to say here is that also in the terms of, you know, in hydrodynamics, this, is, this, was, quite kind of, this was kind of special. Frank Ulich had become particularly excited because the first thing that we do if you open a hydrodynamics textbook is you coarse grain, I'm going to say like that, away the necessity to think about the torque balance between volume elements. You just go to smaller scales and capture angular momentum by vorticity in the flow field. So there's really no need to think about torque balances in fluids except if you have a fluid that actively generates torques. Okay, so that's what happened here. Um, so, you know, we derived a kind of complete hydrodynamics of active chiral fluids together with Frank and could use this to then quantitatively relate the distribution of the motor proteins now also with the handed uh, part of the flow field. So this is shown in this graph, okay? And that's exciting perhaps for a physicist, but it becomes particularly exciting when we realized that something that was discovered 30 years ago, which is the cellular event that gives rise to left-right symmetry breaking in the nematode worm. This is a shift of two cells at the four to six cell stage transition. This shift of cells, in fact, is driven by torque generation in the cortex and chiral motion of the fluid at a particular cell division process. I hope you can see it here. These two cells, when they divide, they counter-rotate. And the way that this now works is, is that, you know, they're sitting on a substrate, on a cell that they're sticking to. So if you have a dumbbell and the two sides are rotate, rotating, this is going to kind of rotate the whole dumbbell. So it's like a segway spinning on the spot. Okay. So this shift gives rise, of these two cells, gives rise to a left-right asymmetric cell-cell contact pattern that's amplified by non-canonical wind signaling. The details not totally clear yet, but that is the decisive left-right symmetry breaking event in the worm. The, the worm doesn't have a heart, but it does have a chiral body plan, um, and this is the way that it comes about. So in the end, we have molecules that need to come to the right places. It's set up patterns. You know, of course, we here's the bicoid gradients uh, that are relevant for the. So basically, there's two worms, two ways in which we think about how this happens. There's, you know, like predetermined patterns, French flag type of model. Cells measure concentrations to know where they are, and in the end, there's also Turing ways. You know, you know, ways that systems can break local, can break symmetries and develop patterns by kind of reaction diffusion feed types of feedback structures. Okay. But, you know, in the end, this is morphogenesis. You're making a 3D shape. <laughs> so, you know, this is going to not happen in the void. This is going to happen. This is going to happen in the context of a mechanical entity. So, we've gotten really excited about the ways in which mechanics communicates with chemistry in order to develop types of uh, morphogenetic uh, patterns. So, um, a theory of morphogenesis should combine mechanics and chemistry. This can, this goes back all the way to Darcy Thompson, I would say. And we've been looking at this. And I'll just give you a glimpse in the worm uh, back uh, you know, to this problem. The cortex, I'm going to say that I've already introduced you to, is the mechanical entity. So here we're looking again at the surface of the worm. And the one cell embryo also establishes a, a, establishes, establishes a chemical pattern. The one cell embryo polarizes. And I'm just going to give you a glimpse in which this polarizes. You're seeing a cut through the middle of the worm here. Okay, so the cortex now, you're cutting, instead of looking at the surface, we're cutting through the middle. So over the course of five minutes, this system goes from unpolarized, no pattern, to polarized and pattern, and it does so by flow. Okay, and now the flow here is on the line because that's the surface. And the point I want to make here is, is that this is a kind of a great example of exactly this kind of relationship between chemistry and mechanics. Um, the flows provide the mechanics and the these paths, these markers of cell polarity that you're seeing here in red and uh, bluish are uh, the chemicals. 
Um, and the way that this works is that there's two ways of feedback. A, the flow of the surface just transports the markers of polarity. So these molecules that sit in the membrane, they're just dragged along with the flow like logs in a river. That's one way of feedback. But it's more interesting that than that because the red species, one of the two species, it also controls the myosin concentration. Okay? So here we see, we're looking at the spontaneous off rate of myosin from the cortical layer, which we can measure by photobleaching types of experiments. And this depends on the local concentration of this marker of polarity. So the marker of polarity that's being transported with the flows also controls the flows. Okay, so that's like this guy here. Okay, yeah, I don't know if you can see the guy. Okay, so he's controlling the flow of the logs in the river. Okay, so this is in a way that where there's more red, there'll be more myosin, there'll be flows converging. So this is also a way in which to break symmetry. And this is, in the end, the way in which the C. elegans zygote, that one cell embryo that I showed you about, actually undergoes uh, polarization. So flow transports chemistry, and chemistry regulates flows. Um, let's switch topics and look at how the cortex is established in the first place, okay? So, um, and the point I'd like to make here, and I showed you a slide a couple of times, here's the one cell stage embryo. It has a cortex, okay? You see all these actin filaments. Down here is an oocyte, you can see it has almost nothing, okay? So one of the first things that happens when cells become fertilized is that they make a new cortex. They, you know, they assemble a cortex for the first time, so no cortex cortex. The cortex is the force generating entity, so I'm gonna have a Star Wars joke, okay? And it's, it's a real meeting, so people, people can laugh if they want to, okay? <laughs> Um, anyway, um, so this is about assembling the actomyosin cortex for the first time. This is the PhD project at Victoria, and she teamed up with um, Arjun, a uh, postdoc, um, who just started his lab in NYU Abu Dhabi. So this is about how to make a cortex, okay? So, um, well, you're going to have to make filaments, and making filaments, we have to go back to, you know, of course, uh, assembling filaments, nucleating filaments. Um, so you're going to have to play with nucleators. And, um, you know, form in ARP23, this is going to be an mainly about ARP23 mediated um, polymerization using also NWASP and ARP23 together. Um, so the only thing I want to say here is you do have to be careful perhaps when playing with nucleation. So, um, it, you know, because, you know, this is kind of self-amplifying. So keep that in mind and what I'm going to tell you. Um, this whole thing turned into a project when we could look at this process outside the mother. And worm, because imaging this inside the mother is a bit difficult because there's all kinds of other tissues surrounding the cells. So Victoria was able to take out the oocytes. When they're extracted from the mother, they no longer receive the signal that keeps the oocytes in the cell cycle rested state, and they slowly start progressing through the cell cycle as a fertilized, and they make a cortex. Okay, that's what you can see here. This is about 15 minutes apart, no cortex. We use a turf microscope, and then here's a full-blown dynamic oscillating cortex a couple of minutes later. In between, there's a period of six to eight minutes where the cortex looks like this. So, you know, there's a couple of things to see. A, there's in magenta actin filaments also pulsating and being assembled. But I want, what I want you to focus on is these white dots. Okay, we're looking at two molecules. We're looking at actin labeled with live act, and we're looking at NWAS, again, part of, you know, up to three mediated nucleation branching um, of cortex in green. And the point here I want to make is the points, okay? <laughs> See all these white dots that are transient? They live just for 20 seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds. Characteristic lifetime is about 10. Um, they come and they go, and they're extreme. You know, this is just looking at the worm, okay? So this is kind of physiological scenario. We got excited because NWASP, they look like little punctate objects, and I'm just going to call them cortical condensates from now on. I'm two floors up from Tony Hyman lab and liquid-liquid phase separation, and you can resist all of this in Dresden only so long, okay, so, and I've given up. So, so this is, touches upon liquid-liquid phase separation, and WASP can phase separate, so we asked ourselves, does this have to do with phase separation, are these condensates, you know, but there's also actin filaments, Mike Rosen has shown that WASP condensates can nucleate actin, so we were quite, quite excited about this, okay. So do these transient objects, do they form by liquid-liquid phase separation? And what I'm gonna show you now is that you know, they're condensates, but they have a particular way of, of self-assembling that's a bit more intricate than just simple liquid-liquid phase separation. So there's this transient phase with short-lived condensates. They're 
round, they're small, of course, they're micron scale, so we can't really segment them out perfectly. But the bigger ones, one or two microns, they look round, they're just underneath the membrane. And again, <coughs> NWASP can phase separate. Um, here's the highest type of resolution that we can look at using, using the structured illumination turf. And uh, as you can see, you can't see much, except one thing, A, they don't have myosin. Okay, myosin here is labeled in green, the same minifilaments. So I want you to focus on these red dots. Here you see one coming and going. Okay, they seem to have, they seem to be quite densely packed also with filaments. No internal structure visible at this scale of resolution. They come and they go. And they have a couple of molecules, up to 3 NWAS, capping protein, but they don't contain formin, they don't contain myosin. Okay, so let's, how do they come ago, how do they come about, how do they go away, what can we learn about the growth kinetics? What are the mesoscale growth laws? That's what we set out to determine. Okay, by which rules do they assemble and disassemble? And to do this, let me take you through this technique, um, which I think is quite useful. So how can we identify these uh, growth kinetics? Well, let's just take one. Okay, you can see it kind of running up here. This is exactly this quadrilateral 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 coming and going. They, and what we're going to do is we're going to integrate the total fluorescence intensity of WASP on one axis in the magenta, in green, the total amount of actin in this quadrilateral quadrilateral as a function of time, okay? And you can see that they grow first by growing WASP, then with a slight delay comes actin, then WASP switches from growth to shrinkage and later actin starts to vanishing. Okay, it makes sense because WASP is part of the nucleating pathway, so that's the kind of the right order of things. So this we can do with one. Uh, we can plot this slightly differently, like this. Okay, so this is, I will, you know, this is kind of a face. I'm gonna call this a face portray. Um, so this is total amount of WASP, total amount of F actin, and now the arrows are the time rate changes. So you can see now how this grows first in WASP, okay, uh, then with a delay with actin, then was switches to shrinkage, then with a the delay actin switches to shrinkage, and the thing vanishes. That's one such trajectory. As you can see, there's a couple <laughs> in each oocyte. From 10 oocyte, we get 35,000 such trajectories. Okay, and now with that, we get this. Okay, so this is kind of the average growth dynamics. This is a face portray, which reveals growth kinetics, which reveals the average behavior of all of these condensates. So we have a it's cut off by just a regime which we identify with statistics. We only take concentration re amount regions where there's enough statistics. Uh, but you can see this collective switch, you know, growth, switch to shrinkage, shrinkage and loss. So this transient kinetics, each individual cortical undergoes this orbit-like uh, behavior until it vanishes. So this data set is incredibly, is incredibly uh, quantitative because, you know, so we can now do, I'm, what I'm gonna do now is not theory, I'm, we're just gonna do um, empirics. We're going to ask the question, which set of ordinary differential equations captures this, these types of growth kinetics, okay? So, so I got quite excited about this because you know, this is, comes from a living embryo growing and so forth, so can we really understand the physics of these assembly and disassembly uh, dynamics? Um, so when we wrote the paper, we quoted Kepler, okay? Of course, this got taken out by the referees. I'm still uh, bummed out about that. Uh, but I do want to make that point because, you know, A, because this just shows how science is done today and how what these people had to deal with, you know, hundreds of years ago. There's a fantastic, I told Curtis Wilson wrote this fantastic summary of Kepler, Tycho Brahe, Newton, how this all came about. So, so, so Kepler, um, you know, just took the data. Tycho Brahe looked at the stars and made this, had generated this incredible data set. Kepler looked at this data set and without knowing what the rules are, just said, oh, there's a couple of peculiarities here. First, if I look at the kind of the areas covered by the lines that connect the planets with the sun, you know, no matter where you are on your elliptic trajectory, you cover equal areas with equal time. Okay, so in one month, you, you know, these two areas are the same. First, second law of Kepler. Third law, even better. The square of a planet's orbital period is proportional to the cube of the length of the same semi major axis of its orbit. So, you know, how did he ever arrive at that conclusion, okay, without knowing what actually happens? And of course, in the end, it was Newton who made sense of it because, you know, this is all due to, you know, gravitational force and the way it scales with distance. Um, so, you know, these days, just to give you a perspective of the field we're forced to do, these, this, you know, all of what these guys were doing, this is my kind of 
you know, introduction to a new PhD student and to really flatten them completely. So I'm not sure it's going to go well here anyway. But, you know, we have to do all these things at once. <laughs> okay. So what you see here is the set of ordinary differential equations that captures this, these growth dynamics. So this is a kind of a predator-prey model, but with a very interesting peculiarity. We also have a volume law. We know how volume depends on wasp and um, live act amounts um, and actin amounts. Um, uh, so there's nothing to discuss. We just ask what's the ODE that fits. Um, and the only thing we have to do a couple of extra tests is this interesting volume-like relationship here. Okay, so this has, this is this type of feedback structure. Okay, so WASP self recruits, recruits actin. Actin can also depolymerize, and this goes back to WASP with negative feedback in order to give this type of transient types of dynamics. Okay, so there's something quite interesting here, okay, because if you take this, this is the WASP time rate change dynamics, Okay, so this is how much, it's the total amount of WASP per, you know, and its time rate change. If you divide this whole expression by volume, you get concentrations. So this is ch time rate change of WASP concentration. This is WASP concentration. And this is two amounts divided by two volumes, also concentration. This is a collision term. So this means at the time scales that this is happening, this is, this is a well-mixed scenario. For me, the best demonstration that you know, this is you know something that's much more liquid-like uh, at, at the time scales that uh, that we're that we're interested in. This recapitulates this is theory and experiment in one uh, um, uh, kind of um, you know face portray just to show you that it fix. You change anything, you change scaling of any parameter, um, it's not going to fit. I'll just take take that for granted. So a couple of other interesting things to see here: wasp grows proportional to wasp. Okay, doesn't grow proportional to the surface area. Liquid-liquid phase separation, this is diffusive encounters with the surface of a droplet. That goes, if you now think about total amounts, that, goes, that scales as the two-thirds of the volume. It's not that, it's growing via the bulk. Okay, that's where I'm saying this is incompatible with liquid-liquid phase separation. Okay, so it's bulk growth. There's a self-organized switch to shrinkage. We've also got excited to really understand how this works molecularly. I don't have the time now to take you through all the kind of kinetic terms that we can identify, um, uh, but we're now looking also on rec reconstituted uh, surface support lipid bilayers, reconstitution system, to see how actin and wasp, these types of uh, objects, can also give rise to this negative feedback uh, from actin to dissolve these individual uh, cortical condensates. We draw an analogy to the dynamic instability of microstubules, but here you have a kind of collective switch to shrinkage um, that's mediated by ARP23, and I'm not going to tell you how because I don't have the time, but the last thing I do want to say here is an interesting peculiarity that I think also is quite telling, and is, you know, it's nice if you can look at this in, in, in cells, which is the following. Okay, and this is the last thing I'll tell you, um, and then we're through. We've got the set of ODEs. We've got a, you know, we, we can also change variables. Okay, we have a volume relation. We can change from total amounts as a function of time um, to, um, the, to changing variables to volume and stoichiometry. Volume is essentially the sum of actin and wasp. Okay, and stoichiometry is actin divided by actin plus wasp. For example, you can define it in this way. If you just change the variables like this, you, you know, the individual cortical corners that will look like this. Um, you know, volume grows and shrinks, and stoichiometry is monotonically increasing because it goes from all WASP to all actin at the end, okay? So when we do this, and it's particular when you do it with the ODEs, here's what you get. You get a volume evolution that is now a function of volume and stoichiometry, but you get a stoichiometry evolution that's only a function of stoichiometry. Okay, now, that's interesting because that just means it's, you know, it's mass action kinetics. I'll take it first to check. This is the face portray. We change variables and it works, okay? Um, but the size independent chemical kinetics, okay? And I think, that, you know, at this point, this is, this is you could say, well, uh, why is that interesting? Well, of course, we all work with conventional mass action kinetics, but this operates in dilute systems with large containers where the volume is fixed. Here, we have a scenario where none of this applies. We have a small container, and the chemical evolution dictates the volume. So there's no reason to assume that these, you get size-independent kinetics from a start. Okay, so reactions simultaneously govern composition and size, and size, and if you don't expect this, you don't expect this for classical condensation physics, so um, that's a bit awkward, and it's resolved in the following way. I think this instability, the switch to shrink is, is what rescues it. Um, so I told you we have the bulk growth term, 
Okay, we only get the bulk growth term if it's not the diffusive encounter with this object that's rate limiting, but the chemical integration of the molecule into the structures. Okay, so this is reaction limited. And the switch to shrinkage, you know, the, the, you know, this kind of active emulsified state, the fact that all of these objects grow for a little bit and then shrink, this is what keeps it in the regime where reaction are limiting. This will keep it in a size independent regime. So you expect size independent dynamics as long as condensates are small enough not to be limited by diffusion. So we have a size independent timer of, uh, for disassembly. I think that's quite interesting um, and, uh, and anyway. So I'll conclude. Um, unconventional kinetics of cortical condensates reaction simultaneously, simultaneously govern composition and size. We can extract the mesoscale growth laws to generate size independent kinetics. The point of all of this is really probably to prevent coarsening, okay? To prevent runaway F actin nucleation, okay? So this is, at the moment, I'm just, this is just hypothesizing. But why all this? Well, you're playing with branched nucleation. You're playing with fire. You have to keep it under control. So probably this is really a way to make sure that this, you don't get a, kind of an explosive runaway nucleation phenomenon. So if you go on YouTube, which I'm sure all here know how to do, um, you know, cl go click useless machine. <laughs> and this is a machine that just, um, I'm just going to play this. Okay, this just turns itself off. Okay. Okay, so that's, I think, what the cortical quantities are doing. <laughs> you can watch this forever. Okay. So physics of morphogenesis, physics of active matter, I think provides us a way to think about it. It's interesting to investigate physics of li living system. Mesoscale is relevant. We are not going to understand these problems unless we know what the relevant state variables are and how they're related to each other and how they emerge from molecular activities. And uh, active matter physics provides a formalism. You know, I'm just going to restate that question that is motivated uh, by Schrödinger. I'll stop here and thank you for your attention.